Hello everybody and welcome to my third of three videos on this, the Sony A5000 right there. Okay, in the first video we talked about what everything on the camera is. In the second video we talked about what it does, except for the menu system. So this video is going to focus exclusively on the menus. Now really quickly, I'm going to show you how to get into the menus. Right here. On the back of the camera is the menu button. We're gonna push that. It brings you into the menu. To navigate the menus, we're going to use the cross pad right here. Down, up, left, and right. So basically, everything you're going to do is going to be done with the cross pads, the menu button pads, and then the center button in the cross pad here is okay for getting into something. And then to get out of it, we push the menu button. Okay. So when we enter the menu, this is the first menu that you see. Now, if there is a specific thing that you're looking for in this video, I'm going to put an index in the video that goes through each of these major tabs up here, which are the shooting menu, settings, wireless, I forget exactly what I call that, uh, applications menu, playback menu, and set setup menu, that's it. To get into the tab, if you're down here in one of these modes, you just hit up, and now you're in the tab. If you're in one of these different specific setting options, that means you're within a sub tab. So the, the shooting menu here has these six sub tabs. If we hit left or right, we can go between shooting menu one, two, three, four, five, and six. Uh, at any rate, so if there is a specific thing you're looking for, just find where it is in your menu and use the index to get you as close to it as possible. We talked here about the shooting mode already in video two. We went through all the different modes and feature, uh, different shooting features in that video. So we're going to skip that here in this video. But it is the first thing that you do when you hit the menu button is see the shooting mode settings so that you can select the way in which the camera is going to operate. The next one here in the camera setting number one is going to be image size. There are three options, 20 megapixels, 10 megapixels, and five. That's large, medium, and small. Uh, honestly, I guess if, back when this was released, SD cards would have been a little bit more expensive and there might have been a need, especially at the entry level market, to save some space on them. Less of an issue now, SD cards are pretty cheap and 20 megapixels, not really that big of an image file anymore. So unless you really, really are hurting for image space, just leave it at 20 because the more information you get when you edit photos, the better. You can always take information away. You can never add it. Your aspect ratio, you have two choices, 3 to 2 or 16 to 9. This is for, st for your still images, by the way. With your video, it will, I believe it will always be 16 to 9, but we'll see that for sure later in the video. But this is your still image aspect ratio. 3 to 2 is standard for still images, 16 to 9 is widescreen. You can always crop down to 16 by 9 from 3 to 2. You can never add information to get back to 3 to 2 from 16 by 9. If you start at 16 by 9 and want to go to 3 by 2, you will make your images even smaller. So, strongly recommend sticking at 3 by 2, and if you need to crop down to 16 by 9 for a desktop wallpaper, you can always do that. Image quality, standard, fine, raw, and JPEG, or raw. This should actually be set to raw. So if you're using any version of Windows from Windows 10, or I would assume they retain this into the future, but 10 and 11 have this. Most raw file formats will display images in your file menu. I cannot remember if this uses DNG or, I think it uses ARW, but an older format of it that does display correctly in Windows. Um, so, in general, RAW is, if you do RAW editing, just leave it in RAW. RAW plus JPEG was for back in earlier versions of Windows, like Windows 7 and before, where RAW files did not provide a thumbnail preview of the image. Fine is JPEG only, standard is JPEG only, and that's just how much compression is applied to the JPEG when you take a photo. Honestly, just leave it at RAW, and if you don't shoot RAW already, if you're upgrading to this camera from, say, a cell phone, and you're learning how to shoot better photos with a, a, a more capable camera than a cell phone, definitely shoot RAW and learn to edit RAW. Panorama size. 
So the options here are standard and wide. So it's not going to let me set this if I'm in manual mode. So it's going to tell me that. So I'm going to go back to the shoot mode and I'm going to select the panorama mode because I'm guessing that's what is needed for this item. Panorama size is standard or wide. And that's basically how big of an image panorama it's going to create. You can never make it higher or taller. You can only make it wider. So wide is going to be wider. It's going to look longer and skinnier when you look at it. Standard is going to be the standard size. And I do not have the dimensions for those written down, by the way. Panorama direction, right, left, up, or down. This is the way that you move the camera when you take a panorama. Are you going to move it to the right, to the left, up, or down? That's all. So when you're in panorama mode, you will need to set those two things when you take a panorama, especially if you change settings or want to take a different type of panorama. Video file format. So here's our video file format setting. And there are two options, AVC HD or MP4. Both of them are 1080. You're not going to get a 4K MP4 out of this camera, I'm sorry. Six one way, half dozen the other, which one you want to use. AVC HD is really good for archiving, MP4 is really good for playback. It just depends on your preferred format and how you edit photo uh, videos. Record settings, 60, uh, 60i 24M uh, FX. So what's it, what are the four options here? This is the best of the options. 60 frames per minute, interlacing, and uh, 24, I forget what the 24 M is. It's not 24 megapixels. Anyway, uh, at the top, you're going to have your best video setting. At the bottom, you're going to have your worst. The main difference is the frame rate, 60 versus 24, and interlaced versus progressive. If you use progressive, actually, the 24p uh, would be better. Progressive is always better than interlaced. So let me take back what I said about the best always being at the top. This is probably going to be your best option. So I suspect that the, I think the 24M and 17M have to do with the actual um, file size. Anyway, if you're into video, a whole lot of this is going to make more sense to you. When I do video, I'm just like, oh, it's got the most pixels. Let's do that. And that's right. This one uh, for 24p, you have to connect to a Blu-ray. Blu anyway, I'm going to switch it back to 60i. That's what I had it set on. No, connect to connect record to a blue. What? There we go. It's if you're going to be recording in video to to use later, it has to be one of the two 17m ones. So, drive mode. So these are your drive mode options. This, and we talked about what these were in the second video, so I'm just going to touch on them right now. You can access these through one of the cross pad buttons on the back as a shortcut, or you can access them through the menu. Single frame, continuous, con speed priority continuous, self timer, uh, self timer continuous, bracketing continuous, single bracketing, or si single shot bracketing, single button press, white balance bracketing, and uh, HDR, functionally HDR bracketing. So right, these four that are on top are going to be the ones you want to use the most. They're going to be the most useful to you. Flash mode, fill flash. All right, let's talk about what all of these different flash settings are. This first one is the flash is off, meaning that no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to fire this flash. If we pop it up, oh, that was a mistake. If we pop it up, well, we still can't use it because of our our shutter, our shutter mode problem. Oh, again. Anyway, I'm not going to do that again. Okay, this first symbol means flash off. When you pop up the flash, it's still not going to fire. Auto flash has to do with uh, how the how much bright how bright the flash is going to be during your exposure. It's going to allow for uh, compensation in terms of brightness to give you correct exposure. Fill flash is going to 
use the flash in a way to provide fill light for your subject. So for instance, if your subject's standing in the, on the beach in the sun and you need to illuminate them so that they are brighter than the background, this is something you could do is fill flash. It will provide added light so that there's just a little bit more light shining on your subject than there is in the background. It will make them kind of stand out from the background a bit. Slow sync is basically um, what you're going to do when you're using your flash with a slow shutter speed and it will allow you, it will still trigger the flash right when the exposure starts, but it will do so with slower shutter speeds. Rear sync will trigger the flash when the exposure ends. Now this really doesn't make a difference if you're taking a picture at 160th of a second. It's, they're the same. But if you're taking a picture at 10 seconds, it makes a huge difference. So imagine that you have a scene where you've got a friend riding a scooter or something like that down the street and they've got a couple lights on the scooter or whatever, okay. And you wanna get a photo of them with them lit up and then lights coming off of them, off uh, trailing behind them from the lights that were on the scooter. You can do that with rear sync. What would happen is you'd do a 10 second exposure. You'd have them ride through the frame and at the 10th second, the exposure ends, the flash triggers right before it ends, and then you've got that photo. If you did slow sync, which is a uh, front curtain, you'd have a, your friend sitting at the other end of the frame and then lights shooting forward from them because it triggers at the exact opposite time in the exposure. So that's the difference between these two. Okay, flash compensation. So flash compensation allows you to manually over or underclock your flash. Basically the flash is more powerful than it is, than uh, more capable than at its standard setting. So let's say that you're in a very dark space and you need a lot of flash light you can manually tell the flash, I need two extra stops of light here because this is really dark and I want my subject to be really well illuminated. Okay, maybe you don't want your subject to be super bright. Maybe you want to have the flash just kind of illuminate your subject a little bit, but not look like a flash. Well, then you can underclock it and bring the flash power down. And that's going to allow you to have a more subtle lighting on your on your subject especially given that your flash is only located directly above your lens which is we know from many many of my videos is the worst possible place to put it next is red eye reduction on or off with red eye reduction if you're taking photos of a person and you take a photo of them with the flash especially with a flash right above the, the lens their eyes their pupils are going to turn red because the light from the flash reflects off the blood vessels in the retina and back at the camera. However, if the flash pulses a bunch of times prior to being triggered, then what's gonna happen is that their pupils will close down and there'll be less light escaping them. So if there's a red tint, it will be much less noticeable. If you're not shooting people, you can turn it off. If you are, it's a good idea to have it on. All right, let's start with the focus mode here which is direct manual focus, manual focus. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right, so we have DMF, which is direct manual focus, manual focus, autofocus single shot, and autofocus continuous. So we'll start up here at the top and go over these. Autofocus single means that when you hold down the shutter button halfway, you'll get your focus, and then when you take your photo, it will focus, it'll, it'll take the photo. If you are shooting in continuous drive mode, it will take that photo and then uh, it will hold the same focus point. So let's say that you have a dog running towards you. In AFS mode, the focus point will hold and you'll get that dog in focus in the first photo and then it keeps running towards you and that focus point's not gonna change as the dog comes to you. So every single photo after that first one will be blurry or at least out of focus. Continuous AF will track that dog as it gets closer to you with each shot. Now the difference between these two AFS and AF, AFC, with AFS, the frame rate in continuous shooting is much faster because the autofocus doesn't have to hunt for the subject between each photo. 
DMF stands for Direct Manual Focus. Now what th that does is if you hold the shutter button halfway down, you get autofocus action. And then if you ho keep holding it, you can use manual focus on your lens to fine tune your focus. So you'll, you'll have to press the shutter button, you'll get your autofocus, and now you can control your manual focus to get um, exactly what you want to have in focus in focus. And then manual focus turns off all of your autofocus at all, and you are solely responsible for focusing on uh, with the lens. Focus area. So the different settings here are wide, zone, center, and fixed spot. Okay, so wide, basically, the autofocus, this is, these all apply to autofocus. And with this, autofocus will look over the majority of the frame to find what it thinks should be in focus and take a picture of it. Zone focusing allows you to set a zone. So if you select OK and then use the cross pads, you can select a zone that will have your focus points. So let's say that you are at a basketball game and you know that the, uh, you've got your, your basketball hoop over here, okay, in the frame. And the guy's going to come in here and he's going to do a dunk. He's going to jump from right here up and do his dunk. Okay. So you want to have all of your focus in here because all of the action is going to ha happen in here. So you'll start taking your photos and when he gets into frame and you'll click, 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 click through the action of the dunk and you've gotten your photos. That's what, so with zone autofocus, you can change exactly where your focus point is and have it align with the action. Center autofocus, ah. Center autofocus sets the autofocus to the center of the image. And fixed spot allows you to have a very fine spot of autofocus wherever you want it to be. So let's say, for instance, that you are at a horse race. And you know that the horse is going to come in from this side over here. Okay, and you want to have a composition because there's a turn right here. You want to have a composition where the horse is running right at the camera, kicking up some dirt right in this spot. And then it looks like you can see from the track that it's going to keep running this way and you've got trees or the grandstands or whatever in the background. Okay, so if you set the autofocus point here, right where you know that horse is going to come around the turn, as soon as it does, you just start clicking the, the photos. The camera will only focus on what's going on in this spot in the image and then you can get the composition exactly as you would like it to be. Autofocus Illuminator. Auto or off. Basically, this is a little illumination that you, you would see on your viewfinder to confirm where your autofocus has found focus. And that's just a, a guide. Whether you want it or not is a complete matter of personal preference. Exposure Compensation. Negative three to plus three. What this does is allow you to intentionally overexpose or intentionally underexpose your images so that you can shoot high key where everything is really bright or low key where everything is really dark. Or if you're out, let's say, taking a photo of a friend and you want to do all manual settings because that's you're really trying to expand your horizons and skills and they're sitting in the shade and it's really bright in the background, you can intentionally overexpose to blow out the background but get your friend in proper exposure. So uh, the other thing is if you have like a very high contrast scene, you might want to underexpose a little bit so that you get some nice shadow detail in the foreground, maybe a lot of shadow, or, or you rather you lose a lot of shadow detail, but you have very high, uh, high contrast dark foreground, but you don't have a super blown out sky. So you get underexposed for that. Un basically what you're telling the computer to do here is intentionally add more or less light to your images. ISO, also called sensitivity, six, same term, six, way one, six one way half dozen the other. It ranges from auto to 100 on the slow side up to 16,000 on the fast side. And this is basically the shooting sensitivity of your camera. That's that. Metering mode, multi, center, and spot. Okay. So multi-metering, what that's going to do is it's going to take a look at the entire frame. And it's going to say, hey, I've got some dark stuff here, 
a little bit of gray tone here and here, and then this light perimeter around here. What, what setting do I need to get a proper exposure across the whole frame? And so this is a good general shooting metering mode. Center weighted metering, what this does is that looks at an area about this big in the frame, and it says, all right, I'm gonna meter so that whatever is in this central area turns out to be generally gray. And that means that if you have something very dark in the center of the frame, like I do right now with this screen, it's going to overexpose the rest of the scene. What's over here that's already light would become super bright. Now, if you took something and you put something very bright in the center of your screen, now everything else would become really dark. Now I'm not, I have my exposure for my video, by the way, set manually so that it doesn't adjust when I do this because that's very annoying in playback. Uh, I'm just doing this for concept demonstration. But if you uh, put something very bright in the center, what's going to happen is the darks will get super, super dark. Now, this is where the majority of the meter reading comes from, the central area. The perimeter provides part of the meter reading. And so, so I don't know the exact percentages, but center-weighted center is usually 60 to 70% 60 to of the metering data comes from the central area, and the balance comes from the perimeter. Spot metering is there's a very, very small area, about a little bit bigger than the tip of this pencil, in the center of the, the frame, and that's 100% of the metering data. Now, if we click OK, it does not do that. OK. Some cameras allow you to link the spot to your autofocus point, and if this camera does that, we'll see it later, because it's certainly not in this menu setting. Camera settings four. Right up front, we have the white balance. Here are your options. Auto white balance, daylight, shade, cloudy, incandescent, fluorescent, more fluorescent, even more fluorescent, yet again fluorescent, flash, underwater, doesn't make any sense whatsoever because this camera's not waterproof. I uh, believe this one is a fil uh, applies a filter to your color temperature. Honestly, this is not one that I ever used or found a use for, so it's not one that I'm going to be able to explain the purpose of to you. Custom white balance custom white balance setup. So let's go through these. Auto white balance looks at the scene and does its best, which is usually pretty good, to figure out what colors should be what colors and automatically applies the, white, the correct white balance to the, each image. Daylight assumes that you are under daylight and uses some presets to apply proper color settings to your images under daylight. So what this does is that let's say that you are outside under full sun, which is full spectrum, your whites will turn out white. However, if you leave this set this way and you go inside under a fluorescent light, your whites will turn green. Shade assumes you're in shade, and shade has a slightly cooler tone than full sun. So if you're outside in the shade of a building, as this displays, this adds a little bit of warmth to your images to counter the blueness in the shade. Cloudy does that, but a little bit more. Incandescent assumes you're under warm incandescent lighting. Now, incandescent is significantly less common than it used to be, but if you have Edison bulbs, um, this is the setting that you want to use. Although with Edison bulbs, this still might not be strong enough. Fluorescent warm white, fluorescent cool white, fluorescent day white, and fluorescent daylight. So depending on the color temperature of your fluorescent bulbs, you'd want to choose one of these four different fluorescent bulb settings to correct for the color cast of those bulbs. Now with all of these different uh, color tone or man-made light sources, our brains automatically do white balance for us. It's cameras that can't. <laughs> so, um, Auto white balance will do that for you, but if you find you're having trouble with auto white balance, then this can be a way around that. Now, one thing, let's say you're doing a bunch of photos for eBay. You've got 4,700 doodads to photograph, and they're all different, but you're going to set up um, your camera 
in front of a softbox. Well, I don't know about you, but the lights I use for my softbox, as the batteries weaken or as they warm up and cool down, the color cast on those changes slightly. So when I use auto white balance on my camera, what's gonna happen is that the whites will often turn out looking different across the images. So what I'll do is I'll set a manual white balance in that setting, and then that makes it really easy for me to adjust in RAW my color tones to obtain white whites. Now they change, the, the tones become more magenta on my lights specifically as they, as they heat up, but it's not enough that it throws off a manual white balance setting. It is enough that it throws off auto white balance. Flash white balance. Flashes use a xenon bulb, including this flash right here, the one in your camera. That's very blue. So this adds a lot of warmth to counter the blueness of the xenon light. Underwater is gonna add even more warmth because underwater light is very, very blue because the warm colors in the, in the visible spectrum are filtered out or reflected by water very quickly. As I mentioned, this is not a setting that I, I used and I'm not gonna be able to really explain it to you. Then custom applies custom settings that you've already applied to your setup. Now here we have custom setup. So press the center or circle button to capture data center, uh, central area of screen. So what this means is I'm gonna take off the lens cap and you can see now I've magically changed into a gray shirt. Coincidence? No, we need a gray screen for this. Actually, I take that back. We need a white screen. I should have worn a white t-shirt today. Anyway, so what's gonna happen is this little circle right here. You're gonna put either a white card or you're going to have something white like a sheet of paper or your, uh, your photo softbox in that circle. Then when you press this, uh, the OK button, the camera is gonna take a photo and it's gonna give you the settings that are needed to turn what was inside of that circle white. So it's done that already. You can see it's gonna be a 4,900 Kelvin temperature with a, um, amber and blue set to zero and green and magenta set to G1. Okay, now if we go back to white balance. We use the custom and now it's saved. If you remember before it said 5500 there. Now it says 4900. So when we took that photo with custom setup, now we've applied it here. This is another really great way to get your whites white when you're doing product photography. If you have three different light sources, one of them is orange, one of them is fluorescent and green, and the other one is an LED like mine that turns magenta, then doing this will allow you to have a fixed white balance setting for repeatable uh, images throughout your entire shoot. DRO Auto HDR, off, auto, and auto. So, dynamic range, uh, dynamic range optimization, off, dynamic range optimization, auto, and there are different levels of how much dynamic range you want to optimize. And then HDR, and I believe that HDR, uh, oh, I believe you either have to set this to, you have to set this to a different mode in the shooting mode, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain what these do anyway. Generally speaking, you want this set to off because DRO is dynamic range optimization. You can think of it like HDR light. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna make your shadows pop and it's gonna pull back your highlights. It's gonna make your images a lot flatter. It's gonna make them look a little bit less like photos as well. And the different levels adjust how much of that the camera does. If you make those changes in your images, you can't undo it. But if you're shooting raw, you can replicate everything that's in dynamic range optimization very, very easily in any raw editor. HDR is gonna take multiple photos and stack them to, to create an HDR image. If, if you're you, taking, you, getting this camera to learn how to be a better photographer, get even a free video editing software like GIMP or an inexpensive one like Affinity, um, they will do a better job of making an HDR from multiple photos for you than the computer in this camera. 
you, this camera is a number of years old now, and uh, a modern software is going to be better. Creative style. All right, so let's take a look at all of these different options. Standard, vivid, portrait, landscape, sunset, black and white, sepia, and standard. All right, we're just going to get this right out there. Stick with standard. All of these effects will change the way your images look, and it is really hard to get rid of them once they've been applied. However, in post, you can mess around with your images as much as you want, and if you start off with standard, you can do a whole lot more editing in post to replicate or improve upon this, these different looks. Let's talk about what they do. Vivid amplifies your color saturation, and basically it's going to make your colors pop just a little bit more. And if you hit left while you're in this, by the way, you can manually adjust your contrast, saturation, and sharpness to change how much each of those affect your specific setting. You can also do that, by the way, in standard. Portrait is going to adjust the, colors, the color tone and sharpness to be more flattering for people. Generally, that means a little bit of softness and a slightly warmer color pitch. Landscape is going to do, well, basically the opposite. It's going to give you a more vivid color pitch and more sharpness. It's going to adjust these settings to give you better landscape photos. Sunset, more warmth. Black and white, well, nothing with color, but it will let you adjust the contrast and the sharpness, and that's going to convert your images to black and white. Sepia, again, no color, but it is going to, because it's like black and white only, with a brown cast. So just keep it on standard and that's going to give you the most flexibility with your images. Picture effects. Oh, this will not work with RAW because it only applies these picture effects to JPEG. So these are all filters. These are all the, you know, th this is a basic set of filters like you would have seen when Instagram was first launched, that type of filter. And I know Instagram still has them, but there are only a handful to pick from. Honestly, same thing with creative style. Leave this set to off because you can do a whole lot more with any video, uh, photo editing software today than this camera is capable of. Plus, once you add those, you can't remove them. Focus magnifier. So this option all right, so I got to turn off DMF. Where was that? Here it is. I'm going to go to MF, and now that straight up manual focus, and that should work. Focus magnifier. So with a focus magnifier, what that does is that allows you to open up this little box here, right? So if we take the lens cap off, now we're at 1x. If I hit OK, now we're at 6.8x, and you can make out the individual weave patterns in my shirt. So you can see down here, that's where, where our, this blowed, blown up area is that area right here. And we can scroll around to find exactly what we want to have in focus, adjust our focus manually until, oh, there we go. Now you can see the actual weave. Hit OK. We can go in as far as almost 14x just to make sure we got the actual weave pattern in sharp focus, and then we take our photo. That, that simple. It is a really nice little tool that um, is awesome if you're using manual focus because if you're taking a picture of a person, you can make sure that you get their dominant eye in precise and sharp focus. And that's exactly what you want to have be in focus with a portrait in general. So at any rate, if you like manual focus lenses, this is a great option to use. Camera menu number five. High ISO NR. NR stands for noise reduction. Cannot use this with RAW. This only applies to JPEGs because it alters the finished results of the JPEG. So basically, if you're using a high ISO, and I forget what the exact cutoff is for this, probably 800 or 1200, may also be able to adjust the cutoff point in that menu. Uh, it's not a menu I'm familiar with because I don't use it. So what high ISO noise reduction does is when you take a photo with a high ISO, the camera will take generally a second photo right afterwards. And then it will compare those two and it will find noise in the images and it will remove it. 
which sounds great, but it also takes away some of your sharpness and detail because it applies some, some, some noise reduction algorithms as well. And you're not going to be shocked to hear this. Any good noise reducing software that you can get online today, and I think there's a handful that are not that expensive, will do a better job than what this camera can do. So your best bet is just to leave this off. And if you're shooting in RAW, it'll be off anyway. Lock on autofocus. This operation is not available with manual focus. Okay, so I believe that this is just an on or off function. And what this does is it can track a subject's focus in the middle of the screen. So let's say that you're taking a picture of your buddy, right? And uh, you're, you're sitting down with him to do a Q&A and you need some photos. You've got them in the middle of the screen and you have autofocus set on. What you can do is use this and once the camera gains autofocus on your buddy who's centrally composed in your image, the autofocus will track as they're moving in and out and chit-chatting with you and, and you can let them be natural. They don't have to feel like they're being posed. And you can just take images whenever when, when your friend is leaning forward and laughing, you can get a photo and they'll still be in focus. Smile and face detection. Basically what you're gonna do here is you need to register a face, okay? And after you register that face, the camera is going to recognize that face and it will focus, track, and take photos when that face smiles. So off turns this feature off. Face detect on, what you do here is you you would take off your lens cap, you'd flip this up to to 180 degrees so that you can see yourself in the screen and you would register your face. Now, face detect is on, smile detect, smile shutter is on, or uh, smile shutter is on, slight smile, normal smile, big smile. So basically, when you have face detect on, the camera will follow you as you move in and out um, while you're in focus. It'll keep focus on you. And then you can trigger the camera to take a photo by smiling, and this allows you to control how much of a smile you have to give in order for a photo to be taken. Soft skin effect, on or off, does not work in RAW, only applies to JPEG. Basically what that does is it, it applies softening to the skin in your portrait subjects. Uh, it's one of those things that, again, you can do a better job with any free photo editing software. And also, I it's an old computer, right? It's an old software in here. So I would leave this to off and do it in post. Automatic object framing, on or off. Again, can't do this in RAW. What auto ob object framing does is when you have lock on autofocus enabled, this will automatically crop your portraits and your macros and other subjects so that things that don't need to be in the frame aren't. There's a few downsides. One, you're going to lose image data from it. And two, it's not going to teach you how to do a better job yourself of framing. So I would recommend leaving this to off because you'll, you'll get better photos if you just do a better job of composing your image get your camera closer to your subject and fill your frame with your subject. Camera menu number six, steady shot on or off. Basically this is in camera shake reduction for, uh, for, hand, for when you're using the camera. I don't think it works with every lens, but um, it works at least with the lens I have on right now. Color space, sRGB or Adobe RGB. Unless you are super, super into the Adobe ecosystem, leave this on sRGB. S stands for standard and uh, or simple, I forget. We're gonna call it standard. At any rate, this is the one you want because it's the one that all photo editing, photo uploading, every everything that does stuff with photos recognizes sRGB. Not everything recognizes Adobe RGB. Auto slow shutter, on and off. What auto slow shutter does, and this, as you can tell by the icon right here next to my pencil tip, applies to movies because it's got the little movie icon. 
This slows down the shutter automatically in dark locations when it's on, but the video, and, and basically it gives you slightly longer shutter speeds with video in darkness. If you don't have this on, when you are shooting video in darkness, your video will just be darker because you won't have enough light. So it will not give you a shutter speed that is slower than 1 30th of a second because the frame rate or 1 60th of a second, depending on your video recording setting. But if you're shooting at 24p, it's not going to go slower than 1 30th of a second because it can't, the frames would overlap. So this will bring you down to a 30th of a second. Now let's say that a place where this would be good is if you're shooting with, an, with uh, a video and you're outside and then you walk indoors, this when it's on, it will automatically slow down the shutter so that your video, your indoor video looks like it's fairly, is, becomes fairly well illuminated just like your outdoor video was. Audio processing, on or off. Basically, this is whether or not you're going to, re oh, audio recording rather. This is whether or not you're going to record audio with your video. The two mics are right here. They are stereo mics, but they are on camera. So lots of different ways to do audio with video. Uh, if you're going to do anything more complicated than the mics here and here, you're probably using a higher end camera for your video work anyway. Wind noise reduction on or off. If you're shooting outdoors, it's a good idea to turn this on because it'll cut the wind noise down a little bit. Shooting tip list. Now this will bring in the shooting tip, the list of shooting tips to uh, help you become better at taking photos. Okay, settings menu one of four. All right, zebra, on or off? These are the two, oh, sorry. Off, 70, 75, 80, 85, and 90, I, and 95. There's a bunch of options. All right, what do these all do? Basically, zebra displays a zebra pattern on parts of the screen that are too bright the zebra pattern will not be recorded in your image, but it will show up on your screen. And I believe that these numbers have to do with how bright that brightness has to be before the zebra pattern turns on. Manual focus assist, on or off. Basically, this is that focus zoom that we looked at earlier where we had the little box and we zoomed in on the threads on my shirt. This allows that to be turned on. Focus magnification time. Two seconds, five seconds, or no limit. So in my review of this video, I, I harped a little bit on how quickly manual focus zoom turned off, not realizing I had not enabled no limit. So if you do use manual focus lenses, set this to no limit, because otherwise your zoom will turn off after two or five seconds. Grid lines, rule of third grid. And then there are some different options here. Rule of thirds, squares, diagonal and square grid, and off. So basically when you look at your screen, you might be able to see here, let's see if I can adjust this a little bit. Okay, so you can see here in this frame how I have these, these grids, right? Those lines will not be recorded on your image, but they are really good for helping you compose your image. So for instance, if you had a shoreline right here, you could use this horizontal line to frame your shoreline so it's level. If you're taking a picture of a building, you could use this vertical line here to make sure that your building is perfectly vertical. Now if we select square grid, let's see what that looks like. Here you can see Instead, the first grid was aligned to the rule of thirds. So the intersections of those lines were your rule of third points. This gives you more lines and it just puts them in a square. Diagonals and squares. If you're doing things that you want to have really be very well center focused, this is really good for that. Also, if you're going to be doing things that require some cropping around the outside, this can help with that because it can help you to better place your objects in the center of the frame. I am a big fan of the rule of thirds grid. I definitely, if you want to learn how to improve your work a lot, using the rule of thirds grid will help you really get a lot of really good work done with your images. And you can see here at these four intersection points, 
if you put key parts of your photo image that are interesting at those four points, you'll generally speaking have a better image composition that more people will find pleasing and captivating. Auto review, off 10, five or two seconds. This is after you take a photo, does it automatically display on the screen for you to review? Always suggest leaving this off. It is a battery drain to leave it on. And quite frankly, if you really wanna become a good photographer, get out of the habit of looking at your photos right after they're taken. Display button. What does the display button do? So the, there's the display button on the back here. It's the top of the control panel. Let me back out of this really quickly. And if I hit the top of the control panel, you can see I'm scrolling through all of these different options. And we saw that in the second video. If we go back to the menu button, this is where we can select which of those options we want to see. No display info, display all info. I personally think that's too much information. I don't want to see that. Check. Graphic display. That's fine. It's, it gives me some information in the shutter speed. Histogram. I find that very, very, very distracting. Uncheck. Enter. Saves that. Now, we just change back and forth between these two options. Okay. What if there's only one of these that we like? We turn it off and now the dis if we turn that off, now the, gr the display button will do nothing whatsoever for us, I believe. Oh, yeah, display button doesn't really do anything now because it's not changing between any of the uh, settings or any of the screens that it could. So that's what the display button does. Settings two. Peaking level, off, low, mid, and high. Now this is for focus peaking. This is how much focus peaking, how bright is the focus peaking going to be and how much, how sensitive is the peaking area going to be to what is in focus. Totally a matter of personal preference and how you want to have your focus peaking be displayed on your screen. Peaking color, red, yellow, or white, completely personal preference. Uh, Personally, I like yellow. It's a, I think it's the easiest color to see of all those three. Exposure setting guide. On or off. This provides exposure settings when you adjust them. Basically, it's a guide to tell you what your settings are. Live view display. Shutter uh, setting effect on. Okay, live view. What this does when you have it on, it means that your image will look on your dis that your image will look like your display. Off will mean that your your display will always show a proper exposure, regardless of how your image will turn out. So, I recommend leaving this to on because if you if you leave this to on and you're going to overexpose your image on accident, you will know because it will show up that way on your screen. Same way as if you're going to underexpose it. However, if you set this to off and your image is going to be overexposed, you won't know because your camera won't tell you. Pre-autofocus. Well, it's not going to let me do this with manual focus, but it will, would let me do it in the autofocus settings. Now, the options here are on and off. On means that the autofocus is always running. Off means it only runs when you have to press the shutter. So I do recommend leaving this to off because it's less of a battery drain. If, and then you will, when you, whenever you press the shutter halfway, you'll get your autofocus. If you leave this to on, your autofocus will always be running and that's gonna kill your batteries. Settings menu three. Zoom settings, optical, clear image, and digital zoom. So, with optical, you will only get the zoom that you have at your disposal with the lens that is mounted on your camera. Clear image will allow you to use digital zoom, but not to a point where your image is quality is sacrificed. Digital zoom allows you to use digital zooming. Okay, what is digital zooming? If I cropped out 
everything except this little center part of the frame and then enlarged it to the full image, that would be the exact same function as having a zoom lens on the camera that zoomed into just the center part of the frame. But if I did that, my images would get very, very pixelated because I'd be enlarging a small part of the image to be the same size as a big part of the image. So digital zoom and clear image even will lower your image quality if you select them. Optical zoom will make you use only what's at your disposal with your lens. And you will always get full resolution images with optical zoom. So I strongly recommend leaving it just on optical. Release without lens, enable or disable. I use a lot of third party lenses that don't have chips. So I have to set this on enable in order to use those. If you don't, if you're only going to use Sony lenses or the kit lenses that come with it, you can set this to disable and now your camera will not take any photos unless a lens is mounted. Auto exposure lock with shutter, on and off and automatic. So what this does is when you have to press the shutter button and you get your autofocus to lock in on something, when it locks in, it will also lock the exposure that uh, settings that were needed at the time of that focus being achieved. So on will always do that. Off will never lock your exposure with your focus. And automatic means the camera is going to decide when to do it and when not to do it. So it's a matter of personal preference and use. If you, let's say, you have a subject that's moving on a horizontal plane, okay, like a car going across at a car race, and you, you have this set to off, to on rather. Over here it's really bright, over here it's really dark. If you focus over here while it's really light, you're going to get your focus and your settings locked in place. You follow the car, and everything's in focus, but now you're suddenly in darkness. Everything's still in focus. It's just that everything's also going to be super dark. So that's what this prevents. Just a matter of how you shoot. Self-portrait timer. This is on or off. So what this does is when you are using this camera, if you flip the screen completely vertical like that. Now the camera would know when this is flipped vertical that anytime you press the shutter button you're taking a self-portrait. So it if you leave this to on you will automatically get a self-timer anytime you flip the screen off. If you set it to off you would have to manually set the self-timer shooting mode. Six one way, half dozen the other, however you use your camera, the best setting is the one you need. All right, so S Auto Image Extract is Superior Auto Image ex Extraction. Okay, so if you remember from, and this is not going to let me do it in manual exposure mode, I have to be set to Superior Auto Exposure Mode in the shooting mode. If you remember from the second video, we talked about what Superior Auto does. And what it does is it takes a whole bunch of different images, combines them, and creates the best image it can out of them. What this does is it saves all of those individual component Im images as well as the final image. So if you're going to shoot superior auto, this is a good thing to set to on because if something gets messed up in the camera superior auto setting and the final image is no good, you still have the component images you can go back and work with. Face registrations, new registration, Order existing, delete, and delete all. Do I have any existing? I don't have any. I didn't think so. New allows you to register a new face for your face recognition autofocus. Order existing allows you to rearrange the order of priority in case you have like four people registered and you have them all in a frame. Delete allows you to delete a face. Like after you break up with somebody, you can delete them from the... From the uh, remembered faces because, yeah, you know, that feels good. Delete all wipes out the entire memory, which I've already done, so there we go. Settings menu number four. Custom key settings. All right, so over here we have a list of keys, question mark. The center button is the, what I call the OK button. It's the round button in the, in the four-way pad. Left, right, down, 
and those are the three th these are the five buttons you can adjust so what this does is let's say that you often change metering modes if you use the question mark button instead of being a help button it will allow you to change the metering mode so you press the ok button and it brings up this list of things you do all right you only use one of the metering modes but you do change ISO a lot. Now you can use the question mark button to change your ISO. So th these are all the different things that you can do with these different buttons. And what I would recommend is finding ones that you use that are not already accessible through other buttons and doing that. Center button, focus magnifier. I do a lot of manual focus, so I found it very helpful to have the focus magnifier at the center. Left button, I assigned a drive mode because it's marked as drive mode on the camera. And the same for the right and the down. They are set to the way that they are marked on the camera. Movie button, always or movie mode only. So here's the movie button up here. It's this little red dot that allows you to start recording a movie. The question is, will it only work when you are in movie mode or will it work regardless of what mode you're in so I like setting this to always because if I'm shooting in manual, uh, if I'm shooting stills, I would like to just be able to hit that button and now I can take a movie of the thing I was just shooting a still of. Autofocus micro adjust. What this allows you to do is go in and micro adjust the autofocus on a specific lens. Since I use tons of manual focus lenses and almost no autofocus lenses, this is not something I'm going to be able to teach you how to do. So if you're interested in uh, uh, micro adjusting your autofocus lenses, you're going to want to go to the manual and read up on how to do that properly. Lens compensation. Shading comp, chromatic aberration comp, and distortion comp. So shading composition will adjust the image so that if you have light loss or vignetting in your foot image, the camera will counteract that. Chromatic aberration, the camera will counteract chromatic aberrations in your images automatically. Distortion compensation, same thing, but it doesn't work with every lens. So with all three of these, if you are editing your photos in a any modern editing photo editing software you can do more with that photo editing software than this camera can do inside of it so i recommend just leaving these to off and um, doing it on your computer all right wireless menu one send to smartphone does exactly what it says First, you have to select the device and connect these two things. Either it's either through, I think it's through NFC, because this doesn't have Bluetooth. It's either through NFC or Wi-Fi. Um, but with this, you can, connect, you can connect your smartphone to your camera, and you can transfer f files straight to your smartphone so that you can share them online immediately. Send to computer. Same exact thing, only... Uh, you have to connect to your computer. I don't transfer files this way. When I move files to my computer, I, put, I take the SD card out, I pop it into the computer, and I transfer it that way because it's a whole lot faster. View mode. Date view, folder view, folder view, and ABCHD view. So this has to do with the way that the camera displays images and movies on your um, TV. So if you connect this to a TV to do a slideshow, you're not going to use this as a camera to record to your TV, but you can use it as a, to, to, to display a slideshow, say for your friends and family. Do you want to display it by the date that the images were taken? By the folders with, for the still cameras, uh, still images rather, the folders for the MP4s, or do you want to just show videos? That's the, that's the different options there. And now you can go with the date view into the specific day of the photo. So if you knew that you were took a weekend trip back here on January 2nd and you wanted to 
show them some specific photos from that date of your trip, you could go back to January 2nd, find those, and show them. Nothing here, because I just oh, accidentally took one photo of myself today, and that's all. Image index. 12 images or 30 images. How many images do you want displayed on the television screen when you're looking at the index? And that's just a matter of how big your television screen is. This is what 12 looks like. This is what 30 looks like. Display rotation, manual or off. Basically, do you want the images, do you want to be able to rotate the images so that they align with the display? Honestly, I've never hooked this computer up to, this camera rather, up to a TV. Two reasons. One, we don't have a TV. And two, uh, I'm not going to just share cam images off my camera. I'm going to edit them and make them look good first. Anyway, um, slideshow. This is how you want to start your slideshow and the parameters. Do you want it to repeat and how long between each image? Rotate. Oops. Manual rotation in action right there. Wireless menu number two. Access point set. What this is going to do is it allows you to select and set up a Wi-Fi. So you can look through here and see all of the different, um, all the different Wi-Fi's. Looks like our internet is down again. Anyway, uh, you can see all the different Wi-Fi's and then you can just connect to the one that you need to connect to in order to um, get the uh, data transferred to your computer. Edit your device name allows you to change the name of your camera. And so what you can do is you can go in here and then just, here we go, you can clear it out, you can name it My Name's Camera or whatever you want to call it. And then that way you know what, when you connect to your computer through your Wi-Fi or your smartphone, you know exactly which camera you're connecting to. Display MAC address shows the MAC address of your camera. SSID PW reset resets the, the SSID and the password on the camera. Reset network settings will reset all of the network settings that you've set up. So let's say that you're going to be selling your camera. You want to erase all of that stuff, especially if you're selling it to one of your neighbors. Application menu, number one, application list. Here's a list of the different applications that you can use on your camera. Honestly, I've never used these. I don't know how to use them. I'm, I'm not the guy to teach you about them. I think really tend to think that a lot of this stuff is not the best use of data space on cameras. Uh, realistically, they're, they're tools and yeah, it is kind of neat to be able to connect them to a TV or whatever or and do some slideshow stuff, but there are better ways to do that. The next one is the introduction and the sir, these will basically just introduce you to things. You know what? This is something else I've never used on this camera because, uh, I mean, I've used, I've used enough cameras that I don't really even read this stuff anymore. Let's see what service introduction is. Okay, so it tells you where to go to get more information about using your camera. And service availability. Uh, you have to connect to Wi-Fi for that first, which this camera's not. So, at any rate, realistically, your applications menu with a camera this old, I don't know that applications are even supported anymore. I didn't look into it. You can probably just completely skip this menu. Playback menu number one. Delete multiple images or all images taken on a certain day. So if you need to burn an entire day's worth of images, you can do that. If you need to burn just some number of images and not an entire day's worth, you can do that too. View mode, date view, folder view, folder view, MP4, and AVCHD view. This is how you view your images in your playback menu. By the date they were taken, which will put everything together by date. As folders, where it breaks out your, where you see your still images in different folders, and your MP4s in different folders, for instance. 
or your AVCHE, and I believe these bottom two only show um, video. I could be wrong on that. Honestly, I always leave it in date view. I, every camera I have, I want the images displaying by when I took them. That just makes it easier for me to find what I'm looking for. So however you display it is fine. My only advice here is that every camera you ever buy will let you display images by date. So if you want all of your cameras to look the same, keep it in date view. Other cameras you buy might not have those different displays. All right, let's get back to the menus. Image index, 12 images or 30 images. This is how many images will be displayed when you have your playback menu. 12 images looks like this. You have 12 images. Well, images and video because this is date view. 30 images looks like this. It will fit 30 images on the screen. Display rotation is manual or off. Off means that the display cannot be rotated when you're playing back images or, or reviewing images. Manual allows you to manually display, uh, uh, rotate images during a slideshow playback. Slideshow, enter or cancel, and these are your settings up here. What's the interval for each image? Up to 30, from one second up to 30 seconds. 10 is usually a pretty good number and repeat whether or not you want your slideshow to repeat when it's done. Rotate allows you to oops, manually rotate an image by hitting the central OK button, just like that. Playback menu number two. Enlarge image allows you to zoom in on an image while you're playing, playing it back, so you can either check your focus or check a specific detail that you want to show to people when you're doing a playback. 4K still image playback. This will play back your still images at 4K resolution on say a 4K TV screen or computer monitor. Protect protects your images so that they will um, multiple images, all images within a certain date, or cancel all images within a, a certain date. This pre prevents them from being deleted. Specify, what's that say? Oh, specify printing. Multiple images, cancel all, or print settings. You can select multiple images to print. You can cancel your print. Or you can also uh, select whether or not you want the date imprint to be on your images when they're printed. Realistically, if you're going to be printing your photos, which you should, it's a good practice, you don't want to print them directly from your camera. You want to take the final images that you've edited and print those. So you'll be doing that from your computer. All right, into the last section of this video with the setup menu number one. Monitor brightness. So this is going to allow you to adjust your monitor. So sunny day is as bright as it gets. If you're outside in full sun, you'll want to set it to sunny day. Manual lets you make your, you, your finder very dark or very bright, but not as bright as sunny day, which is like plus three. Volume setting, anywhere from, I'm at six right now, to whatever the numbers are, probably zero up to about 10 or 12. Um, this is how loud the playback is when you play back video. Audio, oh, it's also how loud the audio signals are when you have audio signals turned on or off. So audio signals are, does your camera make a noise when you push a button or take a photo? Uh, they sound not great, I'm not gonna lie. One of the nice things about mirrorless cameras that don't have a shutter is they're very quiet and there's no reason not to have these off so that it is maximally quiet. Tile menu, on or off. This is just how you wanna have your menu interface. This is what the tile menu looks like. So instead of having the tabs along the top, it has these six tabs right here along the bottom. Delete confirmation, cancel first or delete first. When you're playing back an image and you want to delete it and you hit the delete button, do you want to leave it to delete the image first or hit cancel and don't delete the image? Basically that's, that's your default setting. So personally, I like setting this to cancel because if I, pull up a good image and I accidentally delete it, I can't retake that. 
But if I pull up a bad image and I accidentally cancel it, I can always go back in and then delete it. Setup menu number two. Power save start time. So basically, I have this set to 30 minutes because making these videos, sometimes the camera can sit not used for all that long. And if I set it to 10 seconds, it's always turning itself off. But this is how conservative you want to be with your battery usage. This is how long the camera is going to be before it turns itself off if you don't use it. For general walking around, I think five minutes is a pretty good number because it's easy to go five minutes or three minutes without taking a photo, but still want to have the camera turn, you know, be ready to go at, af at three or four minutes after you took your last photo. Ten seconds is very quick. One and two minutes also feel pretty quick, and 30 minutes, quite frankly, is very, very long. But largely, this is personal preference for how long do you tend to go between photos. Demo mode, on or off. This action is currently disabled. That's fine. So demo mode is like the store display. Back in the day when Best Buy or Circuit City or wherever were selling these, they had a demo mode that was basically like a video that would play and some minimal functions you could do with it. If you turn that on, then you get that demo mode. Leave it off. HDMI resolution. Auto 1080 progressive or 1080 interlaced. Progressive is going to give you better image quality. Um, so if you can if you can set it, force it to 1080p, that's a better choice. Control for HDMI, on or off. This has to do with can this camera control the HDMI settings during playback. Honestly, again, I'm not the guy to teach you about this because I've never connected this camera to a TV and I won't. USB connection, auto, mass storage, MTP or PC remote. Okay, so mass storage allows you to transfer files from this camera to your computer. That's the one realistically that you should set it to. However, that said, the USB connection on this is not fast. It's, it's an old USB 1 or USB 2 micro connection. This is very slow data rates. If you have a any SD card in this, this that this camera can use, and you put that SD card into the SD reader in your computer, the file transfer rates will be significantly faster. So there's no reason to connect this camera to your computer uh, at all. Setup menu number three. USB LUN settings, multi or signal. Basically, multi is the default and you should try it first. If your camera cannot make a USB connection to your computer, then you try sig single. That's the best I've got for you on that because that's what the, the manual says. Language, which language do you want all of the menu items to display in? And these are your six, item, uh, six options. Date and time setup. Basically, this allows you to adjust whether or not you're using daylight savings time. If you're not in the US, then this does not matter to you one bit. Shouldn't matter to us either. We shouldn't have it anyway. Date and time allows you to set the date and time to uh, adjust them to whatever the actual date and time is. And date format is how you would like to have your date information displayed both in date stamping on your images, I think actually just in date stamping on your images and in the computer's playback. Area setting. This is where you live in terms of time zone. So the camera knows what, where you're at with your, uh, what time it is and whether or not you have daylight savings time. Well, daylight savings time on or off controls that. Area setting will just tell it what time zone you're in. Setup menu number five. Sorry, number four. Format. This is going to format the, the SD card. File numbering, series, or reset. So what this does is when, if you do series, it's going to start at image one and go up through image 9999. And then it'll go back to one. If you do reset when you're at image 3649, it will force you... Uh, force the camera to go back to one. So if you're doing something like multiple shoots, it can be a good idea to force reset. However, when you transfer files to, to your computer, you can find that you might accidentally overwrite if you force reset. 
So my best suggestion to you is just to leave it on series because the odds of you getting 10,000 uh, images to transfer back to your computer at once are slim. Uh, the most I've ever done in a shoot is 7,000 photos. And that is so many photos. Anyway, select your record folder. Allows you to select the, uh, the, the folder on your camera that you're going to be recording things to. New folder allows you to create a new folder. And it will tell you what the name is when it's created. It's going to create it in a standard format, one of the standard Sony formats. Folder name. Standard format or date format. Now, I like date format a lot because that creates a new folder every day. So, it's very easy for me to go into my SD card after shooting for like a three or five day trip. And then I can see which dates I took each photo on. And because I organize my, my photos by date, not by trip or anything like that, it makes it a lot easier for me to keep track of my photos in my folders. It makes file transfer a lot simpler. Recover image database. So if your image database gets corrupt, you, corrupted, you can recover it by doing this and it will let you know if it needs to be recovered or if no uh, no uh, image database was found. Set up menu number five, the last three. My voice hurts so much. All right, display media information. Still images. Fine JPEG setting, 20 megapixels. You can take 4,055 images with the SD card that's in here right now. Movies are set to AVHCD at FH, and I could take four hours and 14 minutes of movies with the amount of space that's left on this SD card. Version. This is your body. Has The camera has um, version 1.10 of the firmware, and the lens has version 0 0.1 of the firmware. Settings reset resets all of your camera's settings and initialize, restores settings to their default and uh, settings and deletes the registered data. So basically, if, you're, if you want to reset all of your camera settings, it will reset your entire, all, all of those settings right here with that one. Initialize is basically like a hard reset and sets it back to factory um, the way it came out of the factory. So that's what those two do. And with that, we have finished all three videos on the Sony A5000, a fun little lightweight, super usable, compact E-mount camera that is perfect for graduating into uh, still photography. Thank you everybody for watching and I'll see you in the next camera video. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing. Thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.